Welcome to the John Gets Games questions and answers vlog for March 2022. This was originally recorded live, but then I edited it down to what I thought were the most relevant questions, and those are going to be the ones that you hear today. I do want to mention that if you prefer to listen to this vlog in podcast form, then you can gain access to that by supporting the John Gets Games Patreon campaign at any level, and you can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. There are other exclusive perks you can gain access to there, including seeing my subjective opinions episodes, where I talk in depth about all of the games that I'm playing lately, and you can also watch some videos early and advertisement-free. The last thing I'd like to ask is if while you are watching this, you want to um, add your own thoughts or maybe uh, questions to the questions that you see here already. And if you do, then please leave a comment about it down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into those questions. Um, so I do have a couple of questions that came in from uh, Patreon supporters of the channel. In particular, one supporter sent me a couple of questions. So I'm going to start off with one of those. Um, both these questions came from RJ. And the first one was, have you played any games of late that you did not have a very high expectations for, which you were pleasantly surprised by? Um, this was an interesting question. I went back through my log plays for honestly like the last five or six months. Um, in general, the answer to this is not really. I do have some actual answers, but... In general, the games I play, for the most part, like 90% are games that I make happen. Like I read the rules to it, uh, I teach it, etc. And so as far as expectations are concerned, I generally only make that effort if I expect to like the game. So it's not very often that I have the opportunity to be surprised at something that I didn't expect to be very good. But that being said, I did take a couple of notes about some that did... Uh, kind of match this to a certain degree. Um, and the three that I wrote down were, the first one was Notre Dame. Uh, I played the 10th uh, anniversary edition. I picked that one up for like $15 at a sale. Uh, I've heard it's great, but as far as my personal expectations were concerned, I didn't really know anything about it. I just knew it was cheap and I heard it was good. And, you know, other people saying a game is good is not necessarily enough to make my expectations huge. So I, I expected it to be okay. What I didn't expect is to really, really like it and find it to be so unique. Like, it's 12 years old. And I was just, I remember uh, playing this game feeling like, how are more people not talking about this game? This game is so neat uh, as far as the mechanics and the, uh, the uh, not the complexity, but it's got this hand drafting thing with kind of like an ongoing engine building thing. And every time I played this, there's been at least one person around the table who has said, wow, this is something I've never played anything like it before. So I guess my expectations were far exceeded there. Uh, Great Western Trail is another one. I didn't expect to like it because I gave it a, a pretty middling review what, like five years ago, back when it first came out. And I got a lot of uh, pushback for it. But um, I decided to play it again uh, just a few months ago. And I really enjoyed it, um, which I was not expecting to. I was I was hoping to not hate the experience because, again, I didn't like it so much back before. And so my expectations were, were um, you know, subverted in that way because I had a lovely time playing it. I did play the second edition, which has a lot of subtle changes, but it's for the most part the same game. Uh, and the other one is Sealand. Uh, that one I knew nothing about before Anastasia brought it over to our house and really wanted to play it. So I was like, okay, sure. Like I literally knew nothing about it. So I didn't have negative expectations. I just had zero expectations. And then I loved the game. Uh, really, really loved it. I now have picked up my own copy. So uh, I think those do a, a reasonable job of answering your uh, your question there, RJ. Oh, that's funny. Adam's <laughs> talking about uh, the Great Western Trail teach. You know what's also interesting? Uh, when I played Great Western Trail a few, uh, two months ago or so, I watched my video to relearn how to play the game. <laughs> I watched my uh, my playthrough, and I just skipped forward using the timestamps to get to the next teachable moment and the next teachable moment, which is exactly what I kind of assume other people are going to do. And I distinctly remember being like, I did a pretty good job with this one. <laughs> like I definitely picked it up and I easily just jumped right into the game after that. So uh, kudos to past me like downloading that because I had no idea how to play the game anymore after all these years. Uh, Bartolis asks, do you always have uh, a list of games that you're going to make the next videos for? And if so, how long? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, I have a, a Google uh, cheat. I guess, you know, it's kind of like a, a database uh, Excel type thing where I do all of my scheduling and I've been doing that in uh, Google Sheets for years now. And I've got stuff going out about three to four months. Occasionally, uh, actually, no, I take it back. I do have a couple of things penciled in for like Essen of this year because a couple of the clients I work with will tell me like all of the projects they want to do over the course of the year with rough times. So I just pencil those in so I can keep my eye on it. And then when it gets within a month or two, I send them an email and say, you know, what's the timing on this actually? And kind of put those in. Uh, but in general, I'm, I'm looking at 
for the most part, the next two to three months. And I've got quite a few projects kind of lined up in that area. Um, I, I felt a little silly using Google Sheets to do my calendar because there's like calendar apps and whatnot. But I, I've put a bunch of kind of coding stuff in there, various equations uh, to tell me like an ongoing uh, idea of how much uh, uh, I'm making <laughs> to give an idea of, you know, I should be trying to seek out more projects or less projects and that kind of thing. Uh, and I think it's pretty slick overall. I've been modifying it for years now. Uh, Burned asks, uh, you usually do quite long videos like Dark Ages and uh, Mosaic. How long does it take for you to do these? Uh, a very long time. <laughs> uh, the The ones like Dark Ages and Mosaic, um, if I was to just pull a number out of the uh, thin air, I'd say those were probably closing on 20 hours, like, like 17, 18 hour projects, uh, which is a lot longer, like easily twice as long or three times as long, depending on, uh, many of the other videos that I make. Uh, so yeah, those are, those are big ones. Oftentimes also a part of the, uh, the problem, uh, in particular, I remember for dark ages is that, uh, the rule books are often in like an alpha stage. Uh, so, uh, for the dark ages rule book, there were no pictures at all. It was a, uh, it was just a word document. <laughs> it was a very, very long word document, but I had to do a lot of, um, I guess, process of elimination to be like, is this a, you know, combat card or is this a combat card? Looking at them, looking at the rules, being like, okay, this is a combat card. Um, it's a lot easier to learn the rules to these games once the rule books are really done. But, you know, doing them for prototypes for Kickstarters, it, you know, I'm not blaming the, the publishers or anything. It's just like an extra hurdle that can certainly take a decent amount of time. Uh, Kieran says, I came across your tutorial playthrough for Bardwood Grove the other day, and it really made me interested in the game. Would you consider it enjoyable enough to warrant a late pledge? Um, I can't give you a good answer on that because like most games that I make uh, videos for, I never really actually played it. Um, in general, the only time I actually quote unquote play it is when the camera is rolling. Uh, I frequently, uh, more often than not, don't play through the whole game. And also when I am quote unquote playing it, my focus is on teaching the game well, uh, you know, stacking the decks and aligning situations to teach things in a good order, not to like experience the game and the randomness of the card draw and, and all of those different things. Also I'm playing against myself, so I can't even like try to wonder what my opponent's going to do. Like in general, I'm building a narrative, um, to try and guide you through the feel of the game and also how it plays. So I'm not sure how good Bardwood uh, Grove actually is or how much fun it is to play. I will say it looked pretty darn neat. Uh, I did uh, rulebook editing for that one. They asked me to do uh, a development pass on the rulebook to try and um, work out some of the kinks. And, and it was definitely a, a pretty looking game and it had some really neat ideas. I'm a sucker for kooky takes on mechanics. And I don't remember a lot about Bardwood Grove because that was like three months ago and I've learned like 30 games since then. But I do remember thinking uh, it did some things that were pretty neat. Uh, so again, unfortunately, I can't really uh, uh, give you a recommendation on whether or not you should back it, but I will admit that it did seem intriguing to me. I guess I can put it that way. Uh, Elise says, have you ever been featured in a board game, like a character card or something? I know the Dice Tower people sometimes appear as characters and promo cards and stuff. Not to my knowledge. Uh, I know a lot of people do that. <laughs> a lot of people in the uh, media side of things uh, get promos and, and whatnot. Uh, I'm not very good at networking, uh, if I'm being honest. Like, I don't really go to that many conventions, especially not the last couple of years. And when I've gone to conventions, I definitely... I, I'm an extrovert with people that I know, and I'm a bit of an introvert with people I don't. So I can kind of be a little bit guarded and whatnot in those types of situations. And I think uh, a lot of people in the media side of things are not <laughs> like that, or at least they get over it a lot better than I do. And so it does seem like, you know, people who get into board games and have promos and all that kind of stuff, they're, they're actively seeking to make that happen, you know, getting promos for their uh, uh, fundraising campaigns and whatnot. And that's not a kind of thing that I've really pushed for. Uh, so it's not the kind of thing that's really happened, if that makes sense. Uh, if I'm being honest, I still, to this day, after like almost eight years, uh, feel a little bit weird having me be a thing on the channel. I know that my name's in the title and whatnot, like, <laughs> but I try to make the games be, you know, the forefront, you know, I'm, I'm a medium to show people games as opposed to like being a personality. And because of that, I've also like backed away from, or I guess not really backed away. I've just never sought to try and make that kind of thing happen. I'm not against it in any way. If somebody asked me, I would certainly entertain it. <laughs> I think that would be pretty neat. Uh, the closest I've ever been to being in a board game is I'm now in the uh, the credits section as like a rulebook editor or special thanks or something like that to like, you know, 15 games or so. So uh, that's where I'm at right now. And, and that's just fine <laughs> overall for me. 
Uh, Kiko Sas says, do you play or enjoy very many abstract games? Uh, for the most part, no, actually. Um, I'm not against them, but it's not something that I've really gravitated towards. Uh, I mean, way back when I was a kid, my first beginnings of board games were definitely abstracts. Uh, I played dozens and dozens, probably hundreds of games of checkers with my grandmother. Uh, my mom taught me how to play chess when I was... I mean, honestly, one of my earliest memories was my mom teaching me how to play chess. So I must have been like seven, six or something like that. Uh, and I played a bunch of chess with her uh, and Othello and that kind of stuff when I was uh, much younger. Uh, but in my recent stint with modern board gaming, like when I fell into it back in 2009, abstracts aren't something I've really paid that much attention to. Uh, I think I do like tactics more than strategy in general in games, uh, games that are super heavy on strategy. That just burns my brain out and it makes me feel dumb. <laughs> so I tend to like games, especially when I first got into modern board gaming like a decade ago. Uh, the more dice in the game, the, the happier I was. <laughs> just like throw dice around like crazy. Uh, I've moved away from that a decent amount, but I still like, you know, tactics that come in games like the input randomness in particular. If you're rolling dice and then making decisions or you're drawing cards or you're doing hand management and that kind of thing. Uh, and in general, um, I know that the definition of abstracts can vary from one person to the next, but my personal feeling on abstracts is perfect information uh, and then usually relatively abstracted components. But I tend to think that perfect information is kind of a prerequisite. Uh, so zero randomness and obviously a heavy amount of strategy because the only thing that's going to happen between your turn and your next turn is just the moves that your opponent makes. That being said, there have been a couple that uh, have stuck out to me a little bit over the years. Well, I say couple, I can only think of one right now. There was this game that came out like nine years ago called Mod X. And it was this abstract game where you put little X's down onto the board and you could kind of like clear areas and like claim spots. I, I genuinely don't remember much about it. I, I filmed a review for it or a full playthrough, something like that, way back near the beginning. It was one of the first press copies of game that I ever got. So it was probably like 2015 or something like that. Uh, that game seemed neat and it sticks out in my head. But as far as other abstracts, I mean, I, I learned how to play Go like seven years ago or so, uh, maybe eight years ago, and I thought it was beautiful uh, uh, and just flabbergasting. Uh, I played a lot of games of Go on my phone, like, uh, you know, going against the easy opponent, and I just got obliterated by it. So I respect the heck out of it, but I wouldn't say I really gravitated towards it. Uh, so that was a really long answer for uh, kind of to say no overall, uh, but I I'm not against abstracts by any means, um, especially like quicker abstracts. I can be uh, find very fascinating, or at least I'm quite intrigued to try, like if it's like 30 minutes or less. Um, but I think that's actually relatively standard for abstracts in general. Maybe I should try to pay a little bit more attention to them. Uh, if you have any abstracts that you particularly like, then I'd love to hear some recommendations. Uh, Shrey says, I'm generally not a fan of abstracts, but I really enjoy Docmus. It's worth trying. I remember that game. I, I never tried it, but I remember when it came out uh, and thinking it looked like it would break my brain. If I remember correctly, it has uh, big square tiles with a square grid, smaller square grid on them, and you like can break the board apart and kind of swing things around and lodge them back in again. I, I don't remember anything else about it, uh, but I, I think it flew under a lot of radars. But when it first came out, I was mildly intrigued, but not enough to try and chase it down or anything like that. Uh, Shrey asks me, what are your go-to methods for deciding start player? Uh, I am very opinionated about this <laughs> for some reason uh, because I think I have the best way to get, uh, come up with the start player, or at least my favorite way, and it's an app on my phone. Uh, I'm actually going to pull it out right now. Uh, I've had it for years, and it's called Fast First. And when I click on it, it just brings up this screen and it randomizes the start player for what is that? Two players all the way up to nine players. And every time I load this up, it just uh, recycles through. And you can see, you just like press that button and it just randomizes for all those player counts. So whenever anyone's like, who's first? I just get out my phone, press one button, boom, boom, boom. And I say, you're first. It's just the fastest first I could imagine. I know some people like Schwazi, which you like, you gotta put your fingers on a phone and wait and stuff. And I guess, you know, there's some uh, toy factor there, but I really like that. <laughs> uh, way back in the day, uh, before I had this app, the gaming group that I, I really fell into board games with would do the thing where you'd like put out one, two, or three fingers all simultaneously, and you'd start with one person, and you'd count that number around. That was really fast as well. Um, so I guess those were a couple of my favorite, but in general, I just pull out my phone. <laughs> uh, Jinray asks, how is Puffin doing? Uh, she is doing just fine. Uh, now would be the time that I would rush over and grab her so you could see her cute little fuzzy face, but she's at doggy daycare today. Uh, we take her to doggy daycare about once a week. Um, 
honestly, just so that she can run around and have a good time. Uh, we did it more when she was a puppy, uh, maybe even like a couple times a week, just so that we could, she wouldn't be in our hair as we're trying to do work. And she's not really in our hair anymore. But uh, what we found is every day I walk her, I go to the same spot. It's a two mile walk and uh, probably six days a week, I take her on this two mile walk. And Frequently when I'm there, we bump into dog walkers associated with the doggy daycare she go to, and she just loses her mind when she sees these people. She's just overjoyed. She runs over. She flips over. She just adores these people. And uh, after seeing this a couple times when we stopped taking her, we were like, you know, let's just start taking her there once a week again because she obviously loves these people and loves this experience so much, and it kind of exhausts her. So uh, we're kind of spoiling her in that way. So she's not here today, uh, but she's doing great. She's a lovely, lovely little dog. Uh, Kiko Sas says, uh, abstract uh, recommendation is Homeworld. It's a fantastic game with a mix of tactics and strategy. Plays quick and gives you the feeling that you're playing a game before mastery. You were not the first person to mention Homeworlds before. If I remember correctly, I think it uses a component system, uh, like a, a pyramid system. Is it is it Looney Pyramids maybe? Where it's like a bunch of components that you can play dozens of games with and one of them is Homeworlds, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, so yeah, you were far from the first person to tell me that it's great. Um, I should try that at some point. I, I don't have the Pyramids if I'm thinking about that correctly, but it's definitely one I would give a shot to considering the number of people who have recommended it. Ryan says, uh, first player, uh, his preferred first player way is to roll two dice and the highest total goes first, uh, how they've always done it. Yeah, that, that does make sense. That, that's nice and simple, but you have to have the dice, right? Uh, so you have to go and find the dice, or I guess if you use it all the time, you probably just have the dice in a cup on your table, so that'd be pretty quick. So that does make sense. Uh, I just like the fact that, you know, I always have my phone on me. <laughs> Uh, Reishi says, Schwazi is great with people who don't play many games. It has a wow factor every time. Yeah, so Schwazi is the one where you put your phone on the middle of the table, everybody puts a finger down, and then once all the fingers are there, it like randomly decides and then like, I don't know, just fireworks or it kind of explodes a little bit on one of the player's fingers and they get to go first. So yeah, from a wow factor perspective, I could definitely see the appeal for that one. Uh, I just tend to like to pull it out and be like, uh, you. And now everybody knows that I have this, so they just kind of trust that I'm being random. <laughs> Uh, Shrey says, I just downloaded Fast First. Thanks for the recommendation. If I remember correctly, I think it was like a dollar when I bought it like six years ago or something like that. Uh, I think it's well worth it, personally. Uh, I think now's a good time to go to the other Patreon question. Uh, all the Patreon supporters of the channel uh, have an opportunity to ask me questions before I do these live Q&As, and I just kind of put them in here because, you know, not everybody can actually attend these live, and it's just another perk for people who support the channel. Uh, RJ, uh, their second question was, can you call out a specific game or two that you simply don't think gets enough uh, or much love that you feel needs it? Maybe one for niche tastes and one for more widespread appeal. Um, I went through like all the games I've rated a seven and above on Board Game Geek and came up with a couple of ideas. Um, one of them, I'm just going to get it right out of the way because I mention this all the time and I'm not going to focus on it, but one of them is Equinox, which is just one of my favorite two-player only games. So as far as the niche is concerned, this is a brilliant, in my opinion, two-player tie lane game that's uh, it's it's pretty uh, combative overall. It's like a really solid, thinky 45 minutes. I love the game. Nobody talks about it. And uh, there it is. It's the one that came out in like 2012. There's been, a, I think, a Reiner Canadian Equinox that came out later, but they're completely different. Uh, as far as other answers, because I, I say Equinox all the time, um, some ones that I thought of, um, I My Favorite Things is a fascinating party style trick taking game that came out like three or four years ago. It's essentially impossible to get a copy of, but I know many people who have proxied their own, like they just built their own version of it because it's a it's a kind of it's a game where everybody is going to make the cards that are going to be played in a trick taking game. So you ask somebody like, uh, "What are your favorite dog breeds?" and uh, rank them like first to like your favorite your, your your favorite five, and then the sixth one is going to be one that you really dislike. Um, so they'll write all those down, and then you ask, somebody else asks, you know, "What are your favorite types of baked goods?" or you know, maybe you could be a little bit more esoteric. I remember once my wife asked me a question. She said, "What are my favorite ages?" So I just put down numbers. I put, you know, like 18, 25, 27, 33, that kind of thing. And then you pass these cards to the people who ask the question. And then you play a trick-taking game uh, trying to beat things out where you're playing cards, but you don't know their value. The actual ranking is hidden to you until the end of the round. So you're trying to figure out, and in that case, my wife trying to figure out what I thought my favorite ages were, um, she aced that round. She got every single one in uh, right because, you know, she's my best friend. She knows everything about me. So she was like, oh, when you were 33, that happened. And when you were 27, that 
that happened. And that was a really good highlight. You probably like this better than that. Um, and so it's just a really fun way to kind of test yourself on what you know about your friends. Or you could do something different where you just ask them about something you don't know anything about them and you learn a bunch about them. Uh, we've had a blast with this. Uh, a friend of mine uh, has a kind of uh, mocked up copy of it uh, that plays up to like eight people. And he kind of figured out a cooperative version, which was super fun to play as well. It's just a fascinating, lovely game. Uh, some other uh, easily looked over games. Uh, Pioneers is a game that came out from, I think, Queen Games like five years ago or so to no fanfare. Like this came and went. Uh, nobody talked about it at all, as far as I could tell. And I really like this game. I've played it like five times now. It's in our collection. Um, I actually have it in our collection because I, I got it from a friend who got it with a Kickstarter and they never even played it. They just, they were so unenthusiastic about it. I picked it up from them. And I think that game is lovely where there is a shared pawn in the middle of the board and you are just moving around, piecing stuff together. I don't want to talk about it too long, but I'm a big champion for Pioneers. I think that game is really cutthroat and lovely. Uh, Key Flow is a game that I really wish people talked about more. Um, maybe it's a little bit more well-known, but it's the drafting, the hand drafting card-based version of Key Flower. And I personally vastly prefer it to Key Flower. Uh, Key Flow is one of my favorite games, period. It's an amazing Euro game that plays up to six players simultaneously. And I can't remember the last time I heard anyone say anything about this game. I uh, key flow is, I think, easily my favorite key game. And the second, my second favorite is Keeper, which is another game that actually I can't remember anybody talking about for years. Um, another one is Reign of Witches. Um, I feel like this one got a little bit of hype maybe in the circles that I follow, but in general, it definitely did not get out of some kind of niche circles. Uh, Reign of Witches is an absolutely brilliant two-player only card game that takes like 10 to 15 minutes to play. Um, you can, uh, it's, it comes from Hollenspiel uh, and you can get it from Hollenspiel. It's Reign of Witches plus a game called Toledo War. It's like a two pack and I highly recommend it. It's not like the best game to ever come out, but I can't remember ever introducing Reign of Witches to somebody and having them not be totally enamored with it. Last time I, I taught it to somebody, they they fell in love with it and we played three games of it in a row back to back because it only takes 15 minutes. It's just really really smart overall. Uh, so I highly recommend that one as well. Uh, so yeah, those are just some uh, of the slightly more niche games that I really like that I feel should get more love. Another one is um, Scorpius Freighter. I've mentioned that one before as well. That one just came and went. Nobody talks about it, but I think it is such a cool engine building, rondel based sci-fi game with a really cool card activation mechanic. Anyway, the Scorpius Freighter is just super cool. I, I read the rules to it about a month ago to kind of refresh myself because I want to play it again. Uh, I didn't actually get it played, but I hope to at some point soon. Uh, PPK asks me, are there any games I regret getting rid of? Um, yeah, uh, this has been asked to me before and my answer has not changed. I can only think of one game that I regret getting rid of and it's called Maori. Um, I had it years ago. I, I sold it years ago as well. It's a really cool tile laying game uh, of building out islands. It's got this fascinating grid system of actually picking up tiles to put down in front of you. It's got a really tight economy of shells and I enjoyed playing it. I, I don't really remember why I got rid of it, uh, but in retrospect, I'm like, man, I really wouldn't mind playing Maori again. Uh, so I definitely might pick up a copy of it if I see it for cheap at some point, but I'm not rushing out to get it. But uh, I do kind of regret getting rid of that one. Jeremy says, any preliminary thoughts on Earth? My wife and I backed the Kickstarter because we enjoy the gameplay mechanics. Very Terraforming Mars, Ark Nova centric with the game aesthetics. Uh, looks wonderful. Uh, my preliminary thoughts are, I also backed the Kickstarter, but I haven't played it yet. Uh, I really wanted to play it on Tabletop Simulator before the Kickstarter project ended, but I wasn't able to make that happen. And the Kickstarter project was, it was a pretty reasonable price. And I decided to go in for it because yeah, I like tableau building, especially spatial tableau building. That seems super cool. I like the art aesthetic and I do like follow type games. Um, I feel like I played a couple of those recently. Boone Lake really got that kind of jostling around in my brain again, where the, the active player does an action and then everybody else also gets to do something when it's not their turn is kind of a secondary thing. Um, Hellas is a game that uh, I played a couple times and really liked the 2017 game that also has that in there. And um, so does Earth. And I mean, every time when it's your turn, you do this and then everybody else does a lesser version of it. And then everybody kind of activates their engine. There's a whole bunch of synergistic engine building type stuff going on in there. It looks super cool. And I decided to back it. So I hope I like it <laughs> because I'm going to have a copy coming my way. Uh, Torres says, it seems like your last couple of plays have been bigger, more complex games. What do you think of that trend? Uh, are middleweight games not as popular these days? 
Uh, I'm curious, uh, what do you mean by plays? If, if you mean by playthroughs, uh, I would agree with you. Um, February was a <laughs> was a tough month for my brain. Uh, there were some some pretty meaty games that I did back to back. I did the Tidal Blades 2 video. I know it's coming out tomorrow, but I did the video for that one back in February. Um, I did the Earth Under Siege as well. Um, there was a couple others. And I, I, it was like four games in a row that were just huge projects with gigantic rule books, and I got, I got pretty fatigued by it. Um, I think that when it comes to Kickstarter stuff, it does seem like more is better, like or more is popular anyway. Uh, more rules, more stuff, more goodies, more expansions, more modules, uh, more bonus actions, that kind of thing. Uh, more theme, too. I mean, like heavily thematic-focused and thematic-forward games oftentimes do very well on Kickstarter. And I think in order to really, you know, get there with a theme, oftentimes designs go pretty hard on complexity. So I think that that is definitely a factor. Um, as far as middleweight games not being as popular, I don't know. I, I kind of, I would kind of agree with that statement. It, it's hard to say because there are just so many games that come out. I am definitely much more interested in middleweight games these days. Like I, I just mentioned before, um, you know, a, a four-page rule book really uh, gets me excited. Uh, and I'm really into games that you can learn in like less than 10 minutes and then take about 60 to 90 minutes to play. Um, honestly, closer to 60 minutes, like 10 minutes to teach, 60 minutes to play. I just want to play like six of those in a row every time I sit down to play games with people as opposed to playing like one or two enormous games that take like an hour to teach and that kind of thing. Uh, maybe that's just because I'm getting fatigued <laughs> from the teach because I tend to teach games a lot. But um, I that's where my personal tastes are going, and it does seem like that is counter to a lot of uh, the general uh, tastes of board games. But I don't know. Again, it's so hard to know what's popular because one thing's popular amongst one subset of people and another thing is popular amongst another subset of people. Like I, I've, um, over the last few months, uh, been pretty active in a Slack forum with a whole bunch of people who love um, train games um, and cube rails games, also trick-taking games. And because of that, I feel like those games almost feel more popular to me in quotes because I am more, I'm experiencing people who are excited about them. Uh, so I would almost feel like, oh, well, maybe train games and cube rails are getting more popular. Well, th that's probably not what's going on. Well, maybe it is, but it's more probably from my personal experience. I'm now in a group of people who like them and talk about them. So it feels more popular because they're getting talked about a lot more. Uh, so maybe it's just like social media spaces uh, where a lot of hype is intentionally built up for Kickstarters. And that just feels like, a very prominent part of, you know, board, the board game scene. Uh, maybe that's why it feels like these uh, these trends are going that way. And maybe they actually are. I don't have any metrics for it. Reishi says, did you already receive kittens, uh, Isle of Cats kittens? Uh, no, I didn't. I did not back that Kickstarter. If it was a Kickstarter, I think it probably was. Uh, Frank West, uh, the guy who designed it, that game and also publishes, uh, you know, he essentially is City of Games, the publisher. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, I'm hoping to meet up with him actually relatively soon. Uh, but uh, while I like Isle of Cats a lot, I feel like there's enough in the box there for me, so I didn't really feel the need to go for an expansion. In general, I'm not crazy about expansions. I happen to have picked up a few lately, but um, in general, I, I try to shy away from them. And this one, like, kittens are cute. I I'll definitely agree with that, but I, I didn't really feel like my copy of Isle of Cats needed more stuff inside the box. Uh, Hugo asks, do I have any experience with coin games? I don't. I don't believe I've played any ca coin games. I believe that st stands for counter insurgents. Um, they're like two player war game ish. I think like highly asymmetric. Usually uh, that's essentially all I know. <laughs> um, I would certainly not mind trying one at some point just to say I did like kind of as a merit badge, you know, to be like, okay, cool. Boom. The coin game merit badge. I now can talk about that a little bit because right now I can't talk about it at all. Uh, I know some people really like them. I know Rodney Smith has been uh, falling into those in a kind of a similar way to like, I've been falling into cube rails and train games. So I don't know, it's very different games, but it's fun to see people, you know, try something and then be like, whoa, there's a, there's a lot over here. I'm going to go over here more in board gaming. And uh, that's, you know, a door I've, I've yet to actually open up. Maybe I'd like it. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Gandalf asks, uh, I totally agree with you on midway games. Uh, in theory, I would love more heavy games, but I just don't have the time and energy to learn and teach heavy games. Um, yeah, uh, I get that for sure. I definitely personally enjoyed heavier games or was more gravitated towards heavy games a few years ago, and I've been pulling back from it. I, I will say my brain is split on this because I'll say this kind of thing like, oh, I want a rule book that's really quick and I like, you know, teaching things really fast. And then 
some new big heavy game will come out. And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> what's that over there? Uh, so, you know, part of my brain is still very drawn to those kind of things. But then I'm just like, oh, the teach, <laughs> especially if I like play it once or twice and then go like three months and then want to play it again. Like I'm going to have to fully relearn the game because there's generally so much going on with them. Uh, Kieran says, do you have a list or even just a mental list of games you're most anticipating coming out in 2022? Not really, if I'm being honest. I, I know some people do. I, I know that a lot of content creators put out like most anticipated lists and stuff because those videos do very well. Um, I tend to be staring down, you know, essentially like looking at my feet. Uh, the, the games that are here are the games that I play, uh, the games that uh, that I'm interested in playing in general, the ones that are in this house um, or that maybe my friends have. Uh, I just don't really have enough mental space to save it for a bunch of anticipated games coming out. I mean, I guess the only things I can think of because they're already in my brain a little bit are Kickstarter campaigns that I've backed that I'm now looking forward to playing. So I could say things like Carnegie and Darwin's Journey. Um, you know, Darwin's Journey, I, I, I'm very vested in that one. I spent <laughs> a, a long time, dozens of hours building the rule book for that one. Um, but that being said, I've really enjoyed playing it online. So I'm, I'm looking forward to playing that one in real life as well. And I backed that Kickstarter. Um, Old London Bridge is a Kickstarter that I backed uh, that I'm really curious to try. Earth, I, I'm essentially just telling you about all the games I backed on Kickstarter because that's kind of the only thing I really have in my brain <laughs> as far as uh, uh, anticipated stuff that's coming out soon. Uh, trying to be bored says, I like coins a lot, but it is really funny as someone in both gaming communities that Euro gamers insist they are war games and war gamers insist they are Euro gamers. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I was actually just a few minutes ago when I was talking about coin, I almost said, these are war games because I thought that they were kind of like war games, but I really don't have a good idea or grasp on what's a war game actually is. Uh, I recently heard the term a waro, which is like a war game euro hybrid. So maybe maybe a coin game is essentially a waro. And I will say I, I've not had much interest in war game type things. And the, the quote unquote war games that I played uh, have not really grabbed me that much. Um, the ones I can think of are like Undaunted, which I respect the heck out of the design, but it just did not grab me. Uh, and also like Twilight Struggle is a game that I owned, played and got rid of because I just turned into such a baby when I play that game, like just a real grouch. Like no one wants to be around me, in particular me when I'm playing Twilight Struggle. Um, I, apparently that's a war game, I think, uh, but I've not really dug into that world at all. I think maybe I've, I've cracked that door open just a little bit uh, and have not been pulled in just yet, but I wouldn't say no to trying others. Uh, Ronell says these games... These days, Euro is more and more of an amorphous term. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I talked earlier about like what an abstract game is. And, and yeah, one person's Euro is, uh, definition is going to be different from another's. For, my, for me personally, when I think of a Euro game, I think of a game that is very mechanics uh, forward. Like the mechanics are, are there. Like the theme is not as big of a deal. Like the theme is kind of like set dressing for the mechanics of the game. In general, when I think of a Euro, I think of indirect interaction instead of direct. So like take away opportunities from players instead of just like, you know, doing something and punching them in the face. Uh, when I think of Euros, I think of uh, building your own sandcastle and somebody else builds their sandcastle. And, and again, going back to the interaction, instead of walking over there and kicking over their sandcastle, maybe I go over here and I take their bucket so they can't use the bucket to build their sandcastle, like that kind of indirect interaction. And also I think of input randomness, like cards being drawn into a tableau that you draw from or card drafting or that kind of thing as opposed to output randomness where you like roll dice to see if you succeed or that kind of thing. Uh, Otis says, I'm considering playing with friends. Oh, considering playing with friends was canceled. Are there any of the games that you were going to play on there that appear in physical games uh, that you're going to be playing with Anastasia? I'm not sure uh, if I'm being totally honest with you. We, we didn't really have like a schedule of, of the, the games that we we're going to do going forward uh, with that one. Um, it's very possible. Uh, right now, the games that we're thinking about playing in general are are, are less known. Not we're, not we're not being super intentional about this, but it seems like Anastasia and I are very excited about these like 60-minute 60 uh, 60 Euros with 10-minute teaches that have been overlooked over the last 20 years or so. And uh, Anastasia in particular has picked up a whole bunch of these. So we have a lot that we are uh, looking forward to trying. Uh, I'm not sure what the first one is going to be. Um, I'm not really sure what, end, uh, what the list is going to turn out to be at all, but we're going to be 
trying to focus on just playing the games we really want to play. And then we hope people will enjoy those videos as opposed to like chasing hype. Um, we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's still very amorphous. We're still uh, developing it. We, we did another test uh, recording session this last Saturday, and it did not go very well from a technical perspective. Uh, I was actually hoping that would be a video we could put out on the main channel, but there were too many audio and uh, vid visual problems with it. So still working out the kinks. <laughs> Uh, Jinrei says, do real life events affect certain games that you don't want to play? I currently have this one with this war of mine, since there is too much overlap with the situation in Ukraine. Um, huh. Yeah, I guess to a certain extent, again, theme is not something that I really focus on all that much. So I guess I just don't get highly thematic games that tend to have that kind of overlap. Uh, but I could totally understand why you would feel that way. Uh, I, I could certainly understand that. Um, <laughs> Jeff, thanks for joining in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, Daniel asks, have I played Wonderland's War? Uh, I have not. Um, I'm interested to try it. I actually did multiple phases of rulebook development on that one, like, like three iterations. So I feel pretty comfortable with it. Um, in general, I have to read the rules to play it, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, I might even be making a video for it. That's still a little bit TBD, but I have not had a chance to play it yet. Uh, Doris asks, what is the last thing that you ordered online? It does not have to be board game related. Um, honestly, I'm pretty sure the last thing I bought online were the extra lights that I have here in the studio uh, and some more bit bowls. I, I got these much smaller bit bowls for filming because the ones that I have are kind of large. So uh, in general, the things that I order, they're usually uh, <laughs> John Gets Games related. All right, uh, that's going to bring this one to a close. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who's joined in on this one live, uh, as well as everybody who watched this one later on. Um, I'll be putting out another one of these in April. The date and time for that will be announced in the update vlog that I'll be putting out in the first week or two of April, so keep your eyes out for that. And thanks again, everybody, for watching. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.